This is Keys to the Shop, Founder Friday Edition. Today we're talking with Justin Hartman, founder of Ozo Coffee Company. Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, Founder Friday Edition. Uh, my name is Chris DeFurio. I'm glad to have you along today. And uh, of course, this podcast is dedicated to giving you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. And, you know, one of the ways we do that is we learn from people who have uh, been in the industry and have succeeded and done great things. And today we're talking with one such person, and that is Justin Hartman, the founder of Ozo Coffee Company. And we definitely cover a lot in today's discussion. Um, Justin has a lot of wisdom and experience to share, and I can't wait for you to hear this interview. I do want to start out by thanking our sponsors. Of course, uh, they help make this show possible. And I want to start with Prima Coffee. Uh, Prima Coffee, they're a specialty coffee equipment supplier based out of uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And from the beginning of their company, they've set out to make the best coffee brewing equipment available to the general public and professionals alike. Um, Their focus is on curating the best equipment for every need that you could have, from grinders to espresso machines, undercounter, refrigerations, uh, pretty much anything you can think of. Uh, If you're looking around your cafe and you need to upgrade your equipment and maybe you're starting a business or you're expanding one, um, the folks at Prima Coffee can definitely help you out. They put a big emphasis on having the expertise to help their customers get the right gear to fit every situation. So I definitely recommend that you go to prima-coffee.com and reach out to them, see how they can help you get set up with the right gear for your coffee journey. And uh, my thanks to Prima Coffee for their support of Keys to the Shop. I also want to thank Pacific Foods, the folks behind the Pacific Barista Series line of non-dairy performance beverages. Uh, Those are designed specifically for professional baristas and the standards for excellence that they demand. So whether it's almond, soy, coconut, rice, or oat milk, its ability to take on the heat from steaming, produce an unmatched silky texture, and keep the flavor balance focused on coffee makes it a perfect choice for your cafe's menu. Uh, Pacific has always been a huge supporter of specialty coffee, and they demonstrate this uh, by uh, listening to the needs of the community and delivering on these great products. So go to pacificfoods.com and learn more about how the Barista Series line of non-dairy performance beverages can help elevate the non-dairy offerings in your cafe. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Pacific, for your support of Keys to the Shop. So today we are talking to Justin Hartman, founder of Ozo Coffee Company, and they are a Boulder, Colorado-based roaster retailer. They are a 2018 Good Food Award winner. They have four stores, and they are also a certified campus for the SCAA, uh, their lab there. And um, they are just a really uh, groundbreaking and standard-bearing cafe and roastery out there. Uh, Justin founded Ozo back in 2007 and for over 10 years now has seen steady growth and development into what Ozo is today. And in today's discussion, we definitely explore many, many aspects of what contributed to their success. Um, We learn lessons in operations, uh, challenges in management. We talk about scaling the business, taking on roasting, and Justin gives us three key pieces of advice for those of you who are owners or operators that I think are very wise and uh, you're not going to want to miss for sure. So there's a lot here in this discussion. um, So let's get right to it. Here now is my interview with the founder of Ozo Coffee Company, Justin Hartman. Well, hello, Justin. Welcome to Keys to the Shop. I'm happy to have you on the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. Really excited for the uh, opportunity. Yeah, um, I'm excited to talk to you all about the uh, history of your company, and I know it's been a pretty busy season for you. You're saying you just got done with a, a festival where it was pretty busy. Yeah, we have have had a, an eventful summer, so we got to set up a basically set up an Ozo pop up shop down in Telluride for the Telluride Bluegrass Festival. And they host about twelve thousand people down there for the <laughs> event, and it's a four day event. So, yeah, we had a we had a great time down there and served served the masses a bunch of coffee, lots of iced coffee. Yeah, made a lot of good friends. You're just recovering now, eh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I had 
fortunately had a, a like six day vacation scheduled for right after that. So it worked out perfect. Nice. Very good. So yeah. this, this is your life. Coffee is your life now. <laughs> is this yes, what sir. you do? Is... Um, what, what was it? What, how did this become your life? What was the, the start of your, uh, pursuing coffee as a career? Well, it's, it's been a, it's been a fun road, um, and, and a, and a great journey. So I really fell in love with coffee as a consumer. Um, you know, I was introduced to, you know, diner coffee, like most people and, you know, hitting the Denny's at late night Denny's as a teenager and, uh, was intrigued by it. Uh, but came across the specialty coffee shop, uh, and in Salt Lake, Salt Lake Roasting, I think it was Salt Lake Roasting Company at the time, but, um, Shortly after that, like literally had my first specialty coffee there. And, and then I would say within the next month, I moved down to Arizona and um, down in Arizona, the, the coffee scene in the 90s, like the mid 90s, late 90s was thriving uh, to be, I mean, quite surprising probably to most people. But it was it was it was really intriguing. The community was going just going nuts about coffee. The the late night coffee scene was thriving. Um and I just got turned on to several different, like, cool little coffee shops down there and started working at one uh, as a, as a you know, not only as a job, but just like I kind of fell in love with the, there was a lot of poetry reading nights and open mics. And like I said, there's a lot of culture around the coffee scene that really intrigued me uh, and drew me in at that point. Long story short, I graduated from college and, and did not really have a lot of passion to pursue uh a career in computers or uh programming and and kind of like down that road i i just really loved coffee and from there i just kind of I, I was working at various coffee shops uh along the way just knowing that i was gathering information for myself to uh you know eventually have a career in coffee like a, a sustainable career in coffee at, you know in the early days i don't know if i really wanted to knew that i was going to have a shop um uh, but my first, uh, coffee shop owner, his name was PZ and he had a coffee shop or coffee house in Yelm, Washington, and then had a, another location in Tempe, Arizona. And so he had this sort of Northwest coffee vibe already. Quality was part of his deal. He was Italian. So he had this roots in coffee and, you know, so I, I, I know I, I know I saw him as a, as somebody to look up to in, in, as a role model, as a, as a small business owner. And I, I think it did inspire me at that point, um, to start really thinking about it. And I did come across, uh, at, through my path in coffee, I, I was fortunate to hook up with a lot of small business owners, uh, a lot of people starting shops for the first time. Um, I think I've, I think I helped like three different organizations, open their stores, pretty much open their doors. Oh, wow. Um, and that was very fortunate for me. One of them was more of a coffee shop kind of restaurant -y breakfast, like a full, full service deal. And I helped him, you know, from the opening the doors, I wasn't a huge asset, I'm sure to helping him open, but I was there to witness it. Uh, and then long story short, I moved to, uh, left Arizona, came up to Colorado, uh, was looking for coffee shop jobs that they were all too far away from my house. I didn't want to commute so far, uh, and came across the ad in the paper. If you can imagine that, um, for someone looking for a coffee shop help, I went and visited this guy. He knew nothing about coffee and he was getting ready to open a coffee shop in about 30 days. Oh no. <laughs> uh, and, which was a, a blessing and a curse, you know, and, and the same for me, it was like, Hey, I know a little bit about coffee. He was smart enough to have a local roaster coming in, giving a bunch of education to the staff. So I just was sucking that up, absorbing the information from that, uh, you know, having a roaster there talking about varieties, single origin coffees. And, you know, this is in this is still pre 2000. So, you know, the uh -huh. idea of things not being a blend and actually focused on roast and flavor profile was, you know, that's that was pretty that was pretty awesome. And that's. Honestly, what drew me into coffee was tasting coffee from different origins going, wow, I can taste the difference. This is Sumatra. Okay, this is Guatemala. You know, and I, I still remember the varieties of the first shop I worked at. And then they had a Kenya. They had a Sumatra. They had a Java. Uh, 
that was awesome. I still remember it. Um, so a, a Costa Rica and so like I, a, a Brazil, like, so those things really just locked in with me and I just kept pursuing. I think I kept pursuing that flavor of coffee and the, the culture of coffee and eventually left that store, uh, that I was ta- referring to and moved up to Boulder. And then, you know, at that point I was like, all right, I'm, I'm a coffee guy. Like I'm, I'm, this is my thing. And my, my next vision or mission at that point was to find the busiest, most well-run coffee shop in, in Boulder. And at that time, this was like in 2000, I found, um, Vicks Espresso, which is, you know, definitely like a second wave, you know, more in that second wave kind of vibe, but they were the, they were doing it better than anyone else in town. So I jumped on board with them, ran with them for like about eight years. And then, um, Ozo was created after that. When you determined that you needed to open Ozo, what was the vision for it? Because, you know, that's a big step from going to just an employee and, and working in these busy shops to creating your own, um, your own vision, your own uh, place. Like, where, did, where does the name come from also, I'd like to know? So let's see here. I, let's start with the, the, the first question a little bit, like about deciding to open a shop. Um, as... So let's like kind of go flashback to 2000, second wave kind of coffee scenes, doing well, thriving, starting to evolve into third wave, you know, or however you want to decipher the the waves, whatnot. But um, as 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 the scene in Boulder was of starting to evolve, and and the the coffee scene in the in the country or globally was starting to evolve. Um, you know, long story short, I think I felt uh, like some things were like I was being held back in the progression of coffee uh, and wasn't really feeling fueled to, to support, you know, to stay in that in that stagnant in, in, a, in seeing coffee changing and evolving so much. Um, I just I just really felt like the only way for me to 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 get to that next level of what I, what I need and what I wanted from coffee was to, was to have to branch out on my own. It it was really, I guess, I don't want to say selfish, but it was basically to to support the vision of, of where I wanted to see coffee go in our town. And I was feeling, uh, a little bit of, um, you know, suppression based on the, based on what the, the other company's visions were. And they, we just started to, as, as coffee was evolving, our, our vision started to kind of unalign, so to speak. Hmm. Okay. And so you and knew have, from previous experience, like there's better out there, but it's not here right now. So I'm going to bring it to them. That's pretty much how it, yeah, that's pretty much how it, how it went. Yeah. So you're, uh, now determined to open this place and you've decided to call it Ozo. Where, where does that name come from? Exactly. So in, in our town, there happened to be, uh, it seemed like there was this trend of coffee shops being named after the owner or some sort of reference to the owner. We had a lot of like, we had like Logan's Espresso. We had, you know, we had Vicks. We had, uh, anyway, a lot of name. So I didn't want to follow that trend. Um, and I, and I really wanted to find, uh, a word that had no preconceived feelings or emotions or just any attachments to it. And I really wanted to create a, an environment for everybody, um, to be welcome from doctors and lawyers to teachers and construction workers and students to just really wanted that community of all walks of life. And I didn't want to isolate like I say, I didn't want to isolate anybody with a name uh, that would detour or attract a certain crowd. So I really wanted something fresh and new. Kind of work my way through is all the words I could think of in in the English uh, language, and started delving into the Spanish uh, kind of really kind of the Spanish dictionary, just kind of plowing through words. It was with my it was with my mother in law and my wife. Like say we were kind of just going through to site going through a bunch of words and came across the word oso, 
uh, in Spanish, OSO uh, means bear in Spanish. And I was like, that kind of caught my attention, you know, and we wanted to find something that was memorable and kind of short and sweet, if, if you know, along those lines. And um, came across the word oso, and I was like, oh, bear in Spanish. I started thinking about it, and it's like I had young kids at that time, and I was using the word bear a lot as sort of a nickname mm-hmm. for my wife or my kids. And so when I saw that word, I was like, oh, man, that kind of resonates. Slept on it. The next morning, woke up and thought, Ozo with a Z, so that the people could pronounce it, and it <laughs> still remains this this kind of elusive word that doesn't really tie to anything. Uh, so yeah, the next day I was like, Ozo, that's what it is, Ozo, O Z O. Nice. Okay, I was and, I was worried for a second. I was like, have I been pronouncing it wrong this whole time? <laughs> well, we we didn't want to have people pronounce it wrong, so we just made it easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so when you opened the doors to your business, what was the response from the community in Boulder? Because like you were saying, there there wasn't much of a coffee scene back then in 2007, at least not the one that you wanted. And you're bringing something new to them, uh, like a higher level of quality. So how, how did they respond to that? Well, I think, you know, I think we took a graceful approach, especially in those earlier days. Um, it, you know, and it, it, I, it, I don't want to say it like it, it wasn't visually drastically different, you know, like, like our Longmont location now is, is visually, dra- visually different than, than even our, our first location. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was more of a, a subtle change, I think. And especially in the early days, you know, it was, we certainly couldn't cram education and coffee education down down the throats of the people. So we, we had a real graceful approach to it. And, um, you know, one of, one of our approaches was, was having a, a heavier roasted espresso and then having a lighter roasted espresso. You know, we, we knew we wanted to, to evolve the tastes patterns of the people, but we also wanted to be able to say, Hey, we have something to satisfy you in, in that more roastier realm of coffee. Um, so we really, we really kind of came in on a graceful note with the, or, you know, a graceful approach to it. And then as we gained trust with our community, we started to educate them more about the nuances of coffee and, and, you know, our, our, our approach to coffee. And nice, we, nice. you know, we, we have a, a drink on our menu, which is you know, commonly known to the, to the masses now as a flat white, but in the in the early days when we opened, it was, it was not well known. And we were in the competitions, uh, network or, uh, you know, the barista competition, uh, had, had taught us, a, you know, that some of, some of how, how coffee was going to be evolving, especially with, with the taste and the, you know, the, the less foamy cappuccinos. And we ended up calling that basically that drink, our house special and the house special at Ozo always, comes with the lighter roast espresso so you didn't really have to ask for it so we we came up with some like kind of you know creative ways to get people to start tasting the lighter roast coffee without even talking about it and it was like oh what's the house special and you're like oh you know it's our at that time it was our 2012 espresso topped with a velvety textured milk and they'd be like oh yeah i'll take that you know and as we started to become friends with them and would be like, yeah, look at the roast on this one compared to the other coffee and, you know, mm-hmm. start talking about. So it was, it was more of a build the trust and then work on the, on the coffee education with them. So you were roasting right from the get go. We actually, um, so that, so my, as you can tell, my, my background has been in retail. Um, and I felt really comfortable and confident opening a retail location and I did not feel so, so confident in roasting. So when we chose the name, we, we wanted to uh, pick a name that had uh, a lot of freedom to evolve. And we wanted to be able to, um, we wanted to be able to eventually start roasting. So we wanted to make sure that our name supported that, uh, that change. So Ozo 
you know, we didn't want it to be Ozo Espresso Bar per se. Um, and so we named it Ozo Coffee Company, knowing that eventually we would roast. So we opened the first retail store, operated that for about two years, uh, got our volume up to a point where I felt like it was where it made sense to start roasting our own. And then, uh, and previous to that, when we opened, we had two different roasters that we were using. Um, and it oddly enough, like, well, not oddly enough, but Allegro who happened, happens to be uh, founded in Boulder. Allegro was the coffee provider for, for Vix. And so I knew, I knew Allegro well. Uh, and so what I did was, um, uh, worked with Allegro and came up with, uh, a custom Ozo blend that, that was very exclusive only to us. And then we started highlighting and showcasing a lot of their spe- more special coffees that weren't able to get out into the marketplace through their, through their channels. Uh, and then we also had another local roaster here, uh, in town that we were using for more of our single origin coffees and that lighter roasted espresso as well. Yeah. Um, and then, like I say, as we, as we started, uh, to grow and expand and get our volumes up, then it started to make sense to, uh, roast Went to, we were going to like, say we were in the, in the, the barista competition network and started, you know, we were up in Portland and up in Seattle and basically like that first year in business, we were up there after, after that next expo, we were up there going to every roaster that we could chat with and talking about roasters and talking about their just, the style of roasting they did and what brand they have roaster they had really started delving into the, what do we need to do next to become that roaster that we want to be? And after that following expo in March, we came back. And so that would have been March in 2009. We bought a roaster three weeks later and we're roasting coffee for ourselves in July. Was that a pretty yeah. steep learning curve there? It was a steep learning curve, but um, you know I have a, an awesome team of of tasters, and um, uh, Nolan Dutton is 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 a partner with Ozo Coffee, and and brought him on board when uh, when we started roasting, and and he and I just have this this passion for flavor, like I was talking about in the beginning, and he he has that that similar. You know, I saw that in him, that similar passion for for the flavor, the origin, the coffee. And we were actually cupping all the coffees that we were getting from the roasters in our store. We were doing a, a store cupping every Friday with with even not being roasters. That's great. And and so we were like educating our employees and our staff, I mean our staff and our customers um, with these cuppings. But we were also learning a bunch about the coffees, even to the point where we were – you know, giving feedback to the roasters going, Hey, what about this one? And, and <laughs> honestly, there was, there was one that slipped through that was served to us. And, and, and when we called them, they were like, they, they quickly recalled that product. And we're like, yeah, that's not roasted to our standards. And we're like, wow, we must be getting, getting good at this, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so yeah, we had this, you know, we already had our, our kind of like our cupping standards set up and, and, we're we're getting our getting our kind of getting our basis for that for that next that next step of roasting and then honestly we we were so fortunate when we bought our roaster we bought it used and it came with uh, I think it was fifteen hundred pounds of coffee oh. um, and and some of it was really bad some of it was in between <laughs> it was all over the place but we had this basically fifteen hundred pounds of free coffee to just start playing with so that's awesome. Yeah. And, and we, and we were fortunate to have some good friends in the industry that were happy to talk to us about roasting at that point, you know, and they didn't certainly didn't give us all their secrets or, or, you know, give us too much information. I don't think we could have digested it at that point. Anyway, they gave us some nice, you know, some suggestions on some things to try to hit and toy around with and, you know, play with airflow and play with different gas adjustments and, yeah, it was it was a steep learning curve, but we've you know I think we've produced a, a decent product in the beginning that was you know I I, I don't want to say comparable in in but it was it was it was it was it was okay <laughs> it was pretty good <laughs> well and, and and it evolved quickly you know 
Yeah, I was going to say, um, your approach to coffee had been you wanted to offer this. You have the house special. You're, you're getting people accustomed to a lighter roast coffee through these means. And you're also offering a more developed coffee for, you know, what people's palates were used to at that time. Um, did you carry that same principle over to the offerings that you offered after you started roasting your own? Do you you know, like have an yeah. accessible line and then then a more lighter roasted um, third wave ish quote unquote line yeah that's that's correct yeah and another fun thing we did with our with our house coffee even even when we had um, other people roasting it for us is is we've we've always tried to have like a in the beginning we kind of did like a darker roast with two of the coffees we did a post roast blend and then we did two of the coffees in pretty and a pretty much medium to lighter style roast one of which was ethiopia um so we we did this kind of post roast blend where it was like a kind of a dark roast and a light roast blend and so people would come in and be like that was a dark roast be like oh yeah and then as we started roasting our own you know we we didn't follow that same post roast blend uh approach but we we made a we made the profile the flavor profile of the coffee match what somebody would describe like a dark roast to be yeah. and then approached it more with a medium you know a nice heavy roast but not like into second crack or anything it was it's more like the you know like a s'mores flavor profile dark chocolate creamy you know vanilla lower on the acidity and so when that person comes in and says do you have a dark roast we can't honestly say yeah we do it's this and it is our one of our darker roasted coffees. It's not a French roast by all means. And then they taste it, and then they say, "Wow, that's really dark," or "Wow, I love that. That's really strong and and and, and bold." And then, like I say, as we start to become friends with them, we can say, "Look how there's really not oil on the beans," <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and and start to educate them in a softer approach than saying, "Oh, we don't do that." Yeah. Is that the same type of approach that you have now? Uh, pretty much is that kind of the enduring you know, principle of how you you roast and present coffee today yeah so we still have a a, a more bold uh you know more roast forward coffee for our bigger latte drinks bigger milk based drinks and then if you order anything 12 ounces and and or 12 ounces or smaller then you're going to get uh a, the lighter roast espresso or a single origin espresso depending on the day Nice. And then if and if you're ordering Americano, hopefully we're talking to you about the two different espresso offerings we have. So uh, we've talked a little bit about how you kind of set up the operations as if you were a roastery already, but you just needed a roaster, and, and that worked out yeah. well. Um, I'm interested to know what were some of the structures that were in place and how you ran the retail um, service end of the cafe uh, and that made you successful early on. Well, like I say, I had a, I had a lot of, a, a strong background in, in retail coffee business. And I definitely felt like that was, I, I had a really strong foundation of what I wanted, how to run it, how to operate smoothly and, and efficiently, uh, which gave me, I, which I think gave us a huge advantage in the early days. And it's like, there are several people that, came up to me as we, after we opened, you know, and I'm like, Oh, I was going to open a coffee shop here. I was like, Oh, okay. What's your background in coffee? And they're, you know, they were an engineer or yeah something along the lines. I'm like, man, if the first time the line hit the door, you're, you would have lost your business. You, <laughs> you, know? you might hit the door, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You might hit the door and run yourself. So yeah, I, I feel like, you know, having that, that history of working in coffee, working in retail, you know, one of my goals when I when I was started working at Vix was to find a super busy, well, well, well run organization. And so, you know, while I evolved in in the approach to making coffee, it was like I did take a lot of like my operational uh, learnings from previous employers to to and I brought that to the table. And you know, quite honestly, through the years, I was taking taking notes about what I liked and what I didn't like, what, how operations, you know, what operations I liked and which things worked well for me and didn't. So when I, when we did open the doors, I had a pretty strong sense of, 
of what I wanted and as it, I, my, I had a pretty clear vision of, of how the store was going to run and operate. How would um, you, how would you summarize your approach to that? Like after all of your notes and, um, learning, you know, you have one store and it's, it's not as busy as you are today, but you still want to use all those principles that you took from the busy stores. How would you summarize what you had learned and applied? Yeah, that's, and that's, that's an interesting uh, a question in and of itself because a lot of that stuff is – it's like innate, you know. It's like this almost like a common sense or, or uh, instinct, you know, for, for me after being in the industry and being around it so long. So it did take a little bit of a, of a, of a learning curve to be able to, to – teach that, you know, and to, to put it onto, into a, into a training manual, uh, and to have somebody else train it other than myself. Um, and so that was probably some of the, in the early days, it was probably easier because there's, you know, a handful of us, six or eight or 10 of us in the, on staff. And it was like, I had my, I was, I was able to see those, see them every, see them every single day. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so it was in the early days, it was really kind of molding that, getting that organization uh, dialed in and then then learning how to retrain it to the next wave of staff or, you know, tr- training it in an effective, efficient manner and, and being able to get the, you know, let's say 90% of that 100% of the information you're hoping to get to them. But in the early days, you're like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. and Oh, yeah, there's this part of the customer service training that's I take for granted. It's like, yeah, you got to teach them that, you know. Mm. Yeah, whether it's counting back change or, you know, saying thanks after the transaction, it's like not everybody knows that, you know. Uh, So just kind of getting through those learning curves of 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 really creating a a a structured training protocol was yeah was was huge. So you're codifying your instincts, putting it on paper, (laughs) figuring out like you know these things intuitively, but saying them is a whole nother ball game <laughs> because and then and then and then getting people to be able to to actually do the functions is is an is entirely another thing uh, you know so well you and, know and it, having a manual right up front it sounds like was uh, a good decision yeah and we did and we did we did uh we had that right out of the gates so it's obviously evolved uh but yeah having having training manuals having a operation manuals sops is is been a huge advancement with ozo and it's something that's like i say it's always evolving and uh we're getting better at it and as we've grown we've needed more and more of that structure well speaking of growing and evolving you know you're putting all of this energy into this one location at a certain point you decided that you needed to open another one um and that expansion was in your future was what was behind your decision to expand? Was it part of the plan from the beginning? Did you want to get to that point of having multiple cafes? And um, how did that transition go? So let's see here. Um, as we were, as we started roasting, you know, we, we saw, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, there was a lot of potential for growth in, in the, in Boulder as well. But, um, one thing we did right out of the gates when we started roasting was we started traveling and and creating direct relationships. I, I or I, I steer away from the word direct relationships a little bit, but you know, uh, building relationships with our farmers. And and one thing we noticed right out of the gates was we could actually have an impact in in the lives of the people we're buying coffee from. And we, we immediately made a relationship in Honduras, um, saw this beautiful farm and organization that they were really just starting to get, get, get going. And, um, and, and we, we saw that we had an impact and we saw that the other buyers that were there were having an impact on the quality of the coffee, uh, on the pricing that was being, uh, presented to the, to the farmers and, um, we started, uh, we immediately helped them with a cupping competition, internal cupping competition with the farmers. 
purchased one of the winning lots, made friends with Omar Rodriguez, and have been friends and partners with him ever since. So part of that desire to grow was like, hey, we can buy 20 bags from Omar this year, but what if we could buy 40 bags from him next year? And what if we can buy 80 bags from him next year? Um, and so with that idea of, of, of being able to help our other communities, I think that was, that was inspiring for us. And also the idea of being able to have more, uh, opportunity to roast more coffee and buy from more origins was very intriguing for us as well, just to have more, more opportunity to roast different coffees and, uh, experiment with more coffees. So what were the, the challenges presented to you as you open store two and you've, you've got to outfit it with more coffee and now you've got more relationships to manage, you know, uh, on both the, the farm side and the employee side. Uh, how did that go? Yeah, the second store was actually, um, it seemed really kind of, it seemed like it was very organic and, and flow, it, the flow was really smooth when we opened the second store. Um, you know, we, where our roasting operations were cruising along, we were, it had been about a year and a half since we'd started roasting. So we've, you know, kind of felt like we had a, a good grasp on things. Um, the, the town, we were, you know, really well received in town. Um, we're definitely, we're creating a following and that, that Pearl street, our Pearl street location came available. And in the early days going, going downtown Boulder would have, was definitely a, a daunting task and, and, Pearl Street's known to just eat people up and spit them out, you know, year after year. Hmm. Um, so, you know, to be able to have an established customer base, know that we were roasting, you know, really had felt like we had good support of the community. It, it, opening that next store was like, okay, yeah, this makes sense. Um, and quite honestly, it, we we were pretty busy, you know, really within a couple of months we were we were, we were cranking along pretty well. So, um, it, that made it a lot easier for us, um, in the sense that we immediately were geared up to handle the business and, and we just, and, and we were able to support the business that was coming through the doors. Our staff's well-trained. We had a good, like I say, we had good training programs in place. Um, and, I, man, I think we just hired, we, I think we hired like 15 people, hired them, or it, it took longer than we hoped to, for the store to open. So we had already hired them. We had them cleaning and stocking the store and helping paint things in the store. So they were like already part of the team for a good, I'd say it was probably a month before we even opened the doors. So they were able to cross train at the other store, which was very helpful. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I, I, I kind of feel like when we opened the doors, they we had such a solid staff. Um, that, like say, having the other store there to be able to train them, have them shadow people, uh, and then pull some of our strongest, strong team members from that first store over to that other store to help, you know, show the way. Yeah, kind um, of import the culture a little bit. Exactly, and we've we've always we've been fortunate in in being able to do that as we open new stores. Cause that's certainly uh, a huge value for Ozo is that cultural element of the, of the stores and how we, how it feels when you walk in the store. So much of that is based on, you know, the vibe that the people working in the store produce. Um, what is it? Hiring 15 people. That's a lot of people to, to hire at, at one time. Um, what is it that you're using as a standard for who you bring on board to help provide that experience for people? What is, what are the standards for hiring at Ozo? I, I think, I, I mean, I'm always looking for people that have some sort of passion. Um, if one, you know, one of my big turnoffs or, or one of the quick questions is, you know, is why are you applying for a job at Ozo or why, why, why do you want to work here? Um, the, the wrong answer is because I need a job that, mm -hmm. that pretty much ends the interview. Everybody, you know, obviously you need a job, you're applying. Um, so what I've, what we've, 
first look for is a passion in the person for something, you know, whether they're an artist or a musician, uh, you know, hopefully they love something, whether they love to cook, whether it's flavor based or artistic or, um, a rock climber, uh, or, a, some sort of sports enthusiast. So it's generally like, I, I, it's, it's very hard to train passion into somebody. Um, teaching coffee, teaching coffee skills, teaching someone how to make coffee is, is a teachable task. Um, but trying to tell somebody to be more passionate, um, is, is a hard thing to ask of someone. Nearly impossible. So, yeah. So I start there. Um, and then, you know, really kind of just delve into what their, what their vision is, what their, you know, what their hopes are in, in, in a job. And, um, hopefully they want to be in a fast paced environment and want to help support that culture and that vibe. And, you know, ask them, generally ask them if they've been to one of our locations, have they sat in one of our stores for a while? Do you see what we do and how we do it? You know, do you want to be part of this team? Um, because we, we do have a fast paced work environment, you know? So it's like the person who comes in and they're like, Oh yeah, I just want a chill job in coffee. Oh God. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> okay, well th- that's not here. <laughs> I'm sure you can find one, <laughs> but that's not here. <laughs> Gosh. Um, so yeah, I mean really just getting into the person personality and the, the, you know, trying to get away from those standard kind of, interview questions and, and really delve into who they are and what their passions are in life. And if they can contribute to our cultures, probably some of the biggest factors in, in getting a, you know, getting hired at Ozo and having good work ethic and not being afraid to work hard. And it, you know, yeah, we were, we were joking around with the, some of the managers or, or we were in a manager meeting the other day where, you know, we were at, we were talking about interview questions and, one of the one of the things I brought up was like, are we still talking about the fact that we mop and sweep? <laughs> like this isn't a you know it it there's there is some glamour to the job, but we're also we also work hard and there's there's some things that might be less favorable that we still do. Like you know oh, we yeah. want to have we want to have clean bathrooms in our cafes. That means somebody needs to walk in the bathroom and inspect them, <laughs> mm-hmm. and that needs to be somebody on on staff. You know, so it's like you know finding that balance. Of, of good character, work ethic, you know, being passionate about something. Is that usually Hopefully. one or two interviews? Usually, uh, it starts with a phone interview, um, and then generally, if they make it through the phone interview, they're probably pretty well qualified. Uh, and then we have two uh, two of our people sit in on the interview process, and then we also have. Um, you know, the word probation kind of is, is a little harsh, but we have a, a two, two week trial period is what we like to call it. Uh, and we just basically set the standard right out of the gates. Like, Hey, you're here for two weeks. It's basically a working interview. Um, if you like it here, that's great. And if you're working well with the, with us after two weeks, we'll let you know. And obviously there'll be communication between there, but if either one of us aren't feeling like it's working out within that two week period, it's sort of like, no harm, no foul, just part ways. Yeah. Um, and so we like to leave that pretty, pretty open and clear. So mm, I'm sure you've sure dodged they're... some bullets in that uh, format. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it's, it makes it easy too. It's like, you know, Hey, this, they're maybe haven't put so much weight on the job yet. So now how many stores do you have now? Four four stores and you've got systems in place. You've got people in place representing Ozo culture to the people of Boulder. And, um, at, at some point you were telling me this when I, when I talked to you at coffee fest in Denver recently that you had brought in, uh, I believe it was an organizational consultant from outside the industry to kind of uh, do more or less a, systems or operations audit. Um, to, can you tell us more about that and what made you make that decision? Absolutely. So I would say what prompted that was, and it's important for, for, for me as well, but to, to understand that there was, there was success and growth within Ozo and, um, 
as we were opening the third store and the fourth store, I think some of the systems that we had in place um, that previously were working very well, I think the syst- I think we just started to outgrow the systems. Uh, and yeah, I, I like to. I, I was referring to it a little bit as like we we're sort of bulging at the seams. Mm. We hadn't we hadn't quite popped yet. Nothing nothing. You know, we hadn't lost any seams or buttons, but it was just starting to feel a little bit like like a, a little bit of that tension and. Um, so I really wanted to, you know, I felt like I was certainly in the, in the thick of all of that. And I really just, I wanted somebody to have a vision from outside the company, Mm -hmm. but I also wanted that person to understand what our goals and visions were and what our, what, what we're striving for in, in the future. And, you know, it's just basically like, Hey, look at it, look at our systems and what we're doing and what, what do you, you know, how, how do you how do you think we can evolve and be better at what we're already doing? So it's, you know, it was really a, it was really a fun exercise to investigate the way in which we were operating, you know, from one store to two to three and then to four and to see which systems along the way became, you know, for lack of a better word, a weak system or the things that survived through the four stores that worked well and, it was, you know, I, I think it was just a, a a nice. It was just us in our growth phase, needing to just dig a little deeper in in our systems and organization. Mm. So now the result is you feel like you have more breathing room, like more more of a foundation under you for your operations. Exactly, exactly. So um, some of the things. I, I think we've seen great improvement with the with just the general overall management of the stores individually stores on an individual level. Um, you know, when we were working with two stores or even three stores, we had a lot of shared staff. Um, there was a lot of overlapping of management duties and such, and we started to separate those a little bit more. So uh, we noticed that um, the managers per at a store location, we're taking more ownership of their stores, um, taking more, um, taking on just more of the responsibilities of, of, yeah, this is the staff member I want here. And mm. it, instead of somebody hiring a staff member and then presenting that employee to the manager, you know, it's like now, now the manager's a lot more involved in who's hired and who's working at their store and each, you know, and, and scheduling of said individuals per store is more of it's. So we did a lot of separating, you know, in the early days it was, it seemed to make sense to do a lot of sharing and intermingling to make tasks, uh, I think more efficient. And then as we grew, that became, it became more daunting it was like, okay, now do this a schedule for three stores or four stores. <laughs> it's like, wow, one one was plenty. <laughs> so we started separating those things and um, you know, and really started honing in on specific store managers, assistant managers uh, for those stores, more of a, a of a team designated to a store, and we definitely started to see more more focus from the management and 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 I think just better direction to the staff and more clear expectations to the staff because there was coming from the, the directions were coming from less people. Right. Who do I listen to? It's, it's hard to know when there's several voices. Does it, exactly. is this like something that you now wish that you had done earlier in terms of the spreading out of responsibilities, just making it more store focused? I, yeah, I think we, I, you know, I think we missed it by a little bit, uh, as far as timing, but it, it, it was a natural progression. It, it, it worked out fine. I mean, it was it was nice because the Longmont store was uh, far enough away from our other three locations that it it started to force that idea. Mm. And then and and so they were already kind of isolated from that uh, sharing a little bit. And so after that after that store kind of got up and established, or opened and established, and we then started working with that other stores with the same idea. Great. Well, it sounds like it's it really made a big difference in the way people feel and work. Yeah, and the, the, I have a couple of other uh, tidbits on that too. Like, I feel like the the management team is more forward thinking 
and more focused on their store's performance and and the future of their store and like they I feel like they have a lot more uh, sense of control over over the performance of their store and how the business is flowing through and how the the staffing that's there so it's really uh, empowered the the management team I I believe and we st- started to do a, a what we're calling a roundtable meeting and so every every two weeks we're having all the store managers um, gather together and just basically you know we have an agenda but it's really about sharing and working with um, ideas and things that are working at other stores and just sharing that information like hey I moved this item here on my counter and I'm selling this many of them now a week um, <laughs> You know, yeah, that's valuable so, information. That's awesome that you're doing that. And that's been a huge, I don't know, it's just empowered it, the management team. And I think it really just lets them feel like they're not, they, they're part of this bigger team, this bigger management team. But then there, there's other people that are also, you know, dealing with the, the woes of management just like they are. So it's like, yeah, we had a fridge go out or we had an ice machine go down or a staff member not show up. How did you deal with that? Or, you know, so it's really been insightful for the for the uh, newer management team too to, to, to learn the ways. So all this change over the years and growth, um, you're able to serve so many people now and you're giving a living to so many people that are your employees. Uh, in, the, in the midst of all of this, I'm sure you've developed character traits uh, and changed as a person since you first opened uh, till now. Like, what things have you found you've developed? What traits have you developed over the years that you feel have helped you lead and uh, serve well in your position? There's definitely been a, a, a large learning curve. You know, it's like we were talking in the beginning of, of managing, say, five or five or ten people at one store, and then all of a sudden you're you know, over at the roastery and you're not able to manage that, that one location like you were before and then adding another store. So it's really, um, I've had to improve on my, my self management skills of, you know, time management of, uh, of course, but just how to manage more people has been a big learning curve and task for me, you know, because setting expectations and setting goals for your team and, and learning how to manage their time and their progress on those goals is has probably been the not the biggest challenge, but probably the biggest tool or progress that I've I've made in 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 those in some of my traits as a, as a leader. I mean, I think I've I think I innately have a a strong sense of leadership and and for whatever you know I don't know where that comes from necessarily, but generally you know I, if I'm presenting. Some ideas, people tend to get on board and get excited about those ideas. And that's, like I said, that's been a, a fortunate trait of that's innate in me. Um, but learning how to, like, take that passion that I'm helping to instill in people and then help them to succeed in their perf- in their position, uh, help them manage properly, has, has been a trait that I've been working on. And communication has probably been a huge focus of mine or it has been a huge focus of mine and, and still is on a daily basis. Um, getting the results you that you're hoping for. And, um, a lot of that comes from communication style. That's one of the things I've been working on the most is how to, how to create a, a, a great communication platform style. I don't know what you want to call it necessarily, but amongst the whole crew, you know, so that the management teams, talking to the staff the way that we want to be, you know, respectful and, you know, have dignity intact and hold them accountable for, for the responsibilities, but also have a, a fun work environment. It's such a trick to, to try to train that, but it's a, it's such a value of Ozo, you know, to have that respect and that, the good work environment and a positive workplace. And, you know, it goes over the counter into the customer's lives as well. And then, when we have a great work environment and a great vibe in there, all of a sudden you notice the customers are talking to each other and the mm-hmm. vibe's very <laughs> fluid and, and it, in the coffee shop itself, you know, not just amongst the staff, but, um, yeah, I know I kind of delved or kind of diverted from my traits, but I think, um, 
strong work ethics and and not being afraid to jump in with the team and has always been a strong trait of mine. I, I, I actually like working in the coffee shop. So it's like, even in my position that I'm in today, one of the first things I did for my barista this morning is I went and grabbed in three gallons of whole milk and a box and a chai, you know, like at six fifty this morning, I was like, Hey Kenny, what do you need? He's like, I could really use some milk. I was like, sweet. I'm <laughs> nice. going to grab that for you. Um, so, you know, like I really like to be engaged and uh, like to be part of the of the operation. So I, I think that's been one of my strong traits. I haven't. My goal wasn't to start a coffee shop and then have an office job. Right. Right. Well said. Yeah, yeah it's, I've, <laughs> I've really, I've always wanted to be engaged in coffee, um, and it's it's hard for me to. It's a little hard for me to step back and give give other people, you know, the, whether it's buying green, green bean, you know, buying or quality control or, you know, training baristas or all those things that I love to do. It's, it's almost hard to like give up that and let somebody else do it because I enjoy it so much. But as we've grown, I realize like I, I am limited to, uh, what one human can do and, you know, have, have an awesome team to help support that. But it's, I think that's been one of my great traits with Ozo is just that I do love the job. I love the industry. I like everything that I, that's involved in what I do. And it's, it's helped keep me inspired. Beautiful. What advice would you have for owners, um, out there listening right now? Um, just from your experience and, things that would really contribute the most to their success what would you say well from the beginning if you're starting a shop or starting starting a project i mean i would say have a really clear vision for for what you need to succeed yeah i think a lot of people you know have this vision of oh i want to open a coffee shop you know or i want to open a roastery and it's like do you like understanding what volume whether it's roasting coffee or cups of coffee understanding what real true volume of, of people or coffee you need to sell or see uh, and understanding the true costs of, of running the business, whether it's the rent, the staffing, the, the cogs, you know, and, and really just delving deep into that and being truthful with yourself. And, and I mean, working through those numbers and realizing, you know, looking at it and saying, can I make a living with this? You know, and, and with the rent being at this price and is this store, is the space adequate enough to do the volume that I'm hoping to do? You know, just making sure that it's not just a, uh, this romantic idea of, of running a business, you know, it's like, can the store actually produce a thousand dollars a day or can it produce $1,500 a day or like, or what is your real, what is your goal for that daily? You know, and how many people do you need to see? And and just really just, I mean, taking a hard look at that without getting caught up in the um, the roman- romanticism of opening a your own store. Uh, yeah, wise advice. <laughs> yeah, they, I think a lot of people just, you know, they they haven't take they don't take a really hard look at that number and and. And then see what comes out the other end. You know, does that mean that you're going to be the barista 12 hours a day, five days a week? You know, or, and is that the career path that you're hoping to go down? Or, you know, are you, are you hoping to open a store that will support a couple baristas, a couple register purse people, and then you're going to then be the manager? And then, you know, does that revenue that you're projecting to support a manager's pay? You know, or a said owner's pay, you know, because a lot of people are looking to open a shop and, you know, I, I don't, it's every town's different, but, you know, it's like if you're doing like $700, $800 a day, it could end up being a, a, a somewhat of a prison sentence, you know, to, to work. Mm. And I've seen that happen with other business owners 
And then it's like, well, now we're closed. Now we're only open six days a week because I don't want to hire somebody. And then it's like, now we're only open five days a week because I need two days off. And now we're closing at 4 p.m. instead of 6 p.m. because I don't want to close that late. And it's like, you, they just work backwards. You know, they, they started this huge thing and then they're working their way backwards to close the doors. Hmm. And that's, so I would say that would be a huge bit of advice and we could go on and on about that. But, um, my next, I, I, I do have three, um, things to nice. hit here. Number two would be, um, you know, surround yourself with good people who are inspiring you and have a, something to contribute to your team. And I don't, it doesn't matter at what level you're, I don't think it, I don't think a position or a level has anything to do with this. I, it could be a barista. It could be your very first register person. It could be your, your very first, you know, bar back. If you have four people on staff, I would, the, the theory still applies. Surround yourself with good people that inspire you. Um, and we've been very fortunate to, um, uh, find those people and attract those people. And then, and then, and they'll, you know, they're helping with that vibe and you're not needing to convince them to bring the vibe. They, they are, they're there to help support you and present that, you know, they really, they're on board with, with your vision. Right. And the third thing would be, um, probably this would tie into the, some of my biggest learning points in the last couple of years would be have very well defined goals and expectations for everyone on your team from, from the, like I say, from the bar back to the barista, to the store manager, to an assistant manager, to someone in your training department, to your green bean buyers, everybody in your, in your network. I think, uh, having a, having a routine meeting with that person, reviewing goals and expectations with that person and setting goals that are in line with the company goals and working on those, whether it's on a quarterly basis, monthly basis, a weekly basis, um, I think having those checkpoints in place is, is definitely leading your team uh, towards success. Man, those are some really good pieces of advice. Thank you so much. Um, Ab- absolutely. Yeah. The, but this whole conversation is really... Uh, energizing and I really am grateful for your time to sort of tell us your story and uh, leave us with that excellent advice. What can people do or where can people go to find out more about um, Ozo and stay in touch with you on the uh, internet? You can always check us out online, ozocoffee.com. Uh, I've got our website up and running there. Just uh, just got into a uh, $5 flat fee uh, shipping anywhere in the nation. That's a new thing we introduced about two months ago. So All that's right. fun and exciting. Um, you can catch us on Instagram. Um, we do a little bit of Twitter stuff, but we're mostly uh, Instagram, Facebook, website. And uh, if you want to reach out to me, Justin at ozocoffee.com is my direct email. I want to chat sweet well thanks so much this is really great hearing all about your your company and you and, and the growth and everything it's really exciting so uh, i'm really glad to have had you on the show thanks justin well thanks so much for having me and it was it was, it was great running into you at expo and um truly honored that you invited me on your show so i really appreciate justin's down-to-earth approach to uh, running his company, to growing it, and uh, taking on the challenges that came his way. There's a lot to learn here, and no doubt you walked away with some nuggets of wisdom that will be helpful uh, for your situation. Uh, Something that really impressed me was the idea that uh, Justin invited outside help to the company to really um, help them restructure the way that the cafes were being run. And in so doing, opened his company up for criticism, essentially. Like the idea of inviting outside help to um, help him 
uh, restructure the way that the cafes were run. And I, I thought, man, that really shows a lot of humility and um, vulnerability to invite somebody to come in and say, give us an idea of what we can be doing better to help the business. And he could sense that things were a little strained. And rather than trying to just uh, muscle down and take on the problem alone, he invited uh, you know, a fresh pair of eyes to take a look at the situation. And it really paid off because you know, their move to put stronger uh, management into each cafe uh, rather than centralizing management the way they were doing uh, seems to have really paid off. So um, big lesson there. I think that was really cool. So my thanks to Justin Hartman for coming onto the show and sharing his story with us. I really appreciate getting to know the story behind the company and learning from that journey has been really great. So uh, thank you, Justin, so much. Of course, if you want the show notes for this episode, you can go to keystotheshop.com. And on the website, there's a place to put your email address on a sidebar. And when you do that, you're going to be signed up to receive a newsletter that has the show notes in it. And the show notes are really helpful because they have the key takeaways and bullet point format, all of the questions um, that were asked and resources also that were mentioned are linked in those notes as well. Uh, in the newsletter, there's also a section of curated content that is uh, links to things that I think would be helpful for you in your journey uh, in coffee. So uh, definitely go to keystotheshop.com and sign up for that. I also want to remind you that Coffee Fest is coming up in LA. That's the uh, 19th through the 21st at the LA Convention Center. It's being uh, put on in conjunction with the Western Food Service and Hospitality Show. And your badge that you uh, purchase to enter the show is also good for that. Uh, food show. So that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, I hope to see you there too. I'll be there judging latte art and giving some presentations. You know, Coffee Fest really is the best uh, trade show for retailers and uh, they just offer a huge variety of excellent and relevant um, and accessible uh, content and resources, uh, classes and seminars, things like that. And the trade show floor is great. There's competitions like Latte Art, Best Espresso, and Best Cold Brew happening. So uh, go to coffeefast.com and uh, check it out. See if uh, the LA show is something you want to attend. And if you are going to attend that, just let me know because I have a coupon that I can send you that'll give you 50% off your admission for Coffee Fest. So uh, yeah, hope to see you there. Now, if you want to contact me for any reason, you can do so by emailing chris at keystotheshop.com. That's C-H-R-I-S at keystotheshop.com. If you have questions, comments, feedback, or interested in training for your cafe or consultation, uh, it would be great to hear from you. So that's it for this episode of Keys to the Shop, Founder Friday edition. I hope you have an amazing week. Thank you so much for listening and uh, being a fan of Keys to the Shop. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and share it with friends. Also rate the show on iTunes if you have the opportunity. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.